Welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and today's title is The Harris-Trump Debate, The World is Watching. I've been doing this show for about seven, seven eight years now. Uh, Jay, you and I have been at this hard, uh, talking about politics and Donald Trump for about seven years. And I think this is the first time I'm, I'm going to do something here that I've never done before. And I'm going to change the title of this show. And you'll have to forgive me, Jay, because I know you've posted these well in advance, so people that are watching know what the title is. But I think given the Harris-Trump debate, it's appropriate to change the title. And the title goes from the Harris-Trump debate, the world is watching, to no, Donald, they're not eating cats, dogs, and pets in Springfield, Ohio. Uh, <laughs> Donald Trump got a shellacking last night. Vice President Harris... Uh, did everything in her, her uh, chest of, 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 of tools in her tool chest that um, baited him. She was, on, she was on point. She was calm. She was presidential. And compare that to Donald Trump, who looked tired, old. He looked uh, angry. He was scowling through most of the 90 minutes of the debate. He clearly was not prepared for the debate. He was ill-prepared, for sure. And not only that, but um, he went off the deep end with his, uh, his points about uh, immigrants eating cats, dogs, pets in Springfield, Ohio, and certainly about how Amer uh, Americans, including Democrats, were, uh, you know, they're allowing to have abortions in the ninth month and even killing uh, children after they're born uh, because that's just what they do. So Donald, Donald Trump is unhinged, and we're here to talk about that today. I'm here with my special esteemed guest, Chuck Crumpton, and my co-host, Jay Fidel. Good morning. Morning. Yeah. Morning, Tim. Wow. I'm glad we're going to distinguish between haters and Haitians. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Chuck. Jay, Donald Trump was unhinged last night, and I think that was one of the strategies that the Harris team had in mind was to bait him. Uh, your impressions of Donald Trump uh, through the 90 minutes of this debate? Well, I don't think he was listening to his advisors. I agree with you that he wasn't prepared. Um, and it, it, it was, um, you know, there's an article which I posted on today's Daily Advisory um, that, that pointed out this was the real him. It, this debate reduced him to the real Donald Trump, his own self. And that means with lots of hate, Lots of insults and lots of lies. We got it all. And she did effectively bait him uh, into showing himself. And, and I thought um, what's interesting is that, um, you know, we liked it. Everybody I know liked it, thought she won, thought she gave him a shellacking, as you said. Um, but I, I'm very interested to see that the MAGA crowd thought he won. They thought he, she didn't shellack him. Um, thought that he was uh, straight talking and he and he knew exactly what to say. And that's a lie too. Um, but um, the the MAGA crowd lives in that world and you can't wean them out of that world. After the convention a few weeks ago, she was she was top of the top of the list. Uh, a week or two later, after his uh, insults began to take root with his MAGA crowd, um, he had reached uh, effectively reached parity, and, and what we should be watching for now is whether he goes back to that same approach with insults and lies, uh, and attempts to reach parity again, get to the top of the news cycle. Um, that's entirely possible, and the mega crowd believes it will happen. They encourage him to do it. So, within you know the context of our discussion, she really whooped him. And um, it's not so much, you know, that she whooped him as much as he whooped himself. So many statements he made were wrong and wrongheaded that anybody who is rational, who watched this thing, would have to assume that he was unfit for the, the office by temperament, um, by mental acuity, um, and in general, by knowledge of the world around us. It, it's very scary, and, and this was pointed out, uh, to think that uh, he, he would be president because he's really unfit. 
And it was clear. And maybe, just maybe, there will be independent voters or undecided voters who will see that truth and vote against him. But I'm not sure that his base, his cult following, will vote against him. I think they are wedded to him forever and ever. And that's the challenge. You know, I during the debate, I was uh, receiving texts from my my dear mega friends. <laughs> and um, <laughs> two things came out as glaring texts from them. And one was that clearly Kamala Harris had memorized each and every word of her response. And I, I text back, I said, you know, actors do not memorize an hour and a half uh, of, of, of speech. Uh, and she's not, she's not memorized anything. She has the points well known. She is speaking uh, glibly about those policies and what she knows. And there is no memorization. There certainly weren't any notes in the debate. There certainly was any, you know, um, visual aids to keep each politician on track. And so that was one of their, their observations that... Uh, Clearly, everything was memorized well in advance. And then the other thing was, uh, to their credit, they said the moderators for ABC were very, very good, which is directly opposite of what the criticism is about why Donald Trump so, did so uh, badly in this debate, is that they were ganging up on him, and they, had, you know, they were waiting in, you know, to trap him. Um, your thoughts about the moderator issue, Jay? You know, I've seen David Muir before and um, on ABC, and I, I always felt the guy was smart. Uh, he was a real journalist, uh, and he was very articulate. And when I saw that he was the one selected for this debate, I said, good news, because he's not going not gonna to let Trump get away with anything. And that was right. He didn't let Trump get away with anything. I must say the moderators were terrific, both of them. And uh, I give them credit for that. I give ABC credit for a really good, wholesome production. On the other hand, um, what I've heard is that, um, is that uh, the Trump and his friends were criticizing the moderators, saying that uh, they, they, they hurt him and uh, their <laughs> fact-checking hurt him uh, and they should lose their licenses, quote. So it's really extraordinary how, how um, you know, what I thought was an excellent moderation job and an excellent production job. Uh, as far as the MAGAs were concerned, uh, they should lose their licenses. This is really, really, really bizarre. Anyway, David Muir was terrific, and yeah. so was the woman. And I really appreciated Lindsay. the fact that he, Lindsay, I, I really appreciated the fact that didn't let Trump get away with anything. On the other hand, I want to add that I thought this was going to be a, a closed mic situation. In other words, if, if you weren't on the clock, um, you couldn't speak. And yet Trump did, and he exceeded his time limits. Uh, the, I, the metric was that she, she spoke 24 times without uh, going beyond her time limit, without misusing the mic. Um, and he spoke 39 times, and he went beyond his time limit and misused the mic. Not that it makes that much difference because he wasn't saying anything of interest or value anyway, um, but it's just that he wasn't following the rules. He never follows the rules. Good points. Uh, Chuck, let's talk about ABC and what they did. Uh, I'll just go down a, a list here. But before I do, uh, I find it humorous that they want, <laughs> they want them to uh, lose their license. Uh, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in the uh, Society of Professional Journalists, the first number one rule is report the truth. So as a journalist, and they're both journalists, um, when they hear an obvious lie or, or you know, um, some gross interpretation of Donald Trump's perception of the truth, um, they have the right to call it out. So let's just talk about what they did call out. Uh, number one, I think the one that was the most humorous was uh, that immigrants in Springfield, Ohio, are uh, eating cats, dogs, and pets. Uh, they did call that out. Uh, number two is that um, abortions are not going up to the ninth month, and certainly no, no child after birth is being destroyed. Uh, they had to call that one out. Uh, in addition to that, uh, they asked Donald Trump multiple times, does he want to see Ukraine win the war? 
Donald Trump refused to answer that. Uh, they asked him multiple times about uh, his participation in the 2020 election and whether he had any regrets. As you know, by his responses, he avoided that like the plague. So those are the kind of the, um, the main things that I saw ABC kind of uh, hold his feet to the fire on. Chuck, what did, what did you think about their job and the times that they did have to intercede here in the discussion and point things out to Donald Trump and to the audience? I think you and Jay have made some really, really important points, and I'm glad this is recorded. <clears throat> Isn't it wonderfully ironic that, as Jay put it, Kamala Harris shellacked Trump? with the unvarnished truth. <laughs> the Carpenters Union would definitely <laughs> shout out for her for that one. Yeah. Also striking that early on, I was a little concerned that the moderators were letting Trump abuse the microphone with his typical bullying lies the stuff he does. But two things that made it clear that there was an intentional choice made, not only by the moderators, Lindsay and David, but by Kamala Harris, to let him do that and hang himself. And the one who signaled it first, actually, was Lindsay. Uh, David Muir was holding Trump's feet to the fire on fact-checking, where his lives were just grossly off the charts and off the walls. Lindsay, early on, hey, instead of doing that, let Trump go out there and hang himself verbally, and then followed up very, very succinctly with a really concise factual statement that showed that he was sitting out there on the end of a branch that his would not bear his weight. And he was going down under the rules of Isaac Newton and gravity, which yeah. he did. <laughs> so he did crash and burn. Two things that I think are worth noting on that. One, from the very outset, Kamala Harris went out there and took charge. Trump hunkered down in his little space. <clears throat> tiny hands, tiny man, tiny conscience, tiny space. <clears throat> in contrast, Kamala Harris came out there, walked confidently hey, across the stage, reached out, shook his, offered her hand, which he, not knowing what to do, took, hey, and she, you know, bid him good luck in the debate for which he thanked her. She took charge right from the beginning. And what she did throughout this was what a really, really good trial attorney, one who's very quick on their feet, one who's experienced, one who knows that the ultimate factor, ultimate goal is offer the opponent the chance to destroy their own credibility. The more you can damage their credibility, the more you can get them to damage their own credibility, the better you come out. Because ultimately in trial, it's a credibility contest. If it weren't, you wouldn't be in trial. If the objective information told you what the answer and the result were gonna be, you wouldn't be in trial. But because there's a he said, he said, or he said, she said, battle going on on credibility. And she is very masterful at that. Whoever has been working with her the last three years has built on her best skills. And she totally took charge of inviting the credibility. She offered a countless repertoire of trapdoors into every one of which he stepped. Yeah, he did. Um, let's go back to visuals. You know, when it comes to debates, I think uh, the most uh, that's often referred to as you know the glaring differences between candidates and, and it, how they appear uh, in front of an audience or certainly in front of the camera would be the Nixon Kennedy debate. 
where uh, Richard Nixon was uh, pale and a bit sweaty, and he was wearing a tan suit. When uh, John F. Kennedy was, you know, had a tan, he was wearing a dark suit. Um, you know, that, that always comes up as the biggest visual difference in a debate, time and time again. Yet uh, last night might be the one that replaces that. Uh, your impression, Chuck, on the visuals, uh, not the actions, but um, just comparing the visuals between Donald Trump and, and Kamala Harris. You, you said it well that he was in a very small personal space. Uh, he seems small, although he's a foot taller than she is. Um, he just looked hunched over. Uh, he looked like he was um, ready to be hit by a blocker on some football team. He looked like he was just uh, very, very tight. And uh, certainly, if you looked at his face, uh, he was frowning and scowling, uh, really from the moment the whole debate started. Your, your impression of the visuals. No, and that's exactly right, Tim. In this, the combination of facial expressions and body language, Kamala decimated him. When he went off the rails, she had prepared this amused look. It didn't get to her. It didn't bother her. It was classically, if you put words to that expression and body language, it's there he goes again. Mm -hmm. We all got that. We could almost hear her thinking that. And then when they asked her, that's what she said. You know, it's the same old, same old. He is a one trick pony. Unfortunately, he has increasingly associated him with one end of the horse more than the other. And that's becoming in increasingly visible. But I think your other point that Trump had no control over his facial expressions or body language. He didn't try to control that. He was squinting, he was scowling, he was withdrawn into himself. He was in a completely defensive posture. And even when he tried to attack, there was a whole aura of desperation to it that Kamala received with amusement. <laughs> yeah. True, very true. And, okay. and I think if they'd flashed on Lindsay and David Muir, you might have seen some of that amusement or shaking of heads on their part, too. I mean, it was just, yeah. there's a difference between fertilizer and quicksand, and Trump does not know the difference because he's dwelling in quicksand, Yeah, going okay. down. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, Jay, um, there was a surprise to me that uh, was revealed and uh, that's centered around the discussion about his 2020 election loss. Particularly in the last two weeks, Donald Trump was quoted to say, I did lose the election by a whisker. And I thought he had made the, tr the turnaround. That is, his campaign aides, advisors said, Donald, if you want to win the 2024 election, you're going to have to admit and get off this 2020 uh, election loss, stolen election loss from you, because that's what made you lose uh, the 2020. And certainly that prevented the red tsunami of 2022. Uh, he refuted that. He said, I didn't say that. I said it in a satirical, uh, sarcastic way. Were you surprised by that at all? His response uh, per pertaining to the 2020 election loss? No, I was not surprised because he's never admitted it before. Why would he admit it now in front of how many million but he did. Of people? He, he, he did admit, he said, I've lost it by a bit. I lost it by a whisker. And I thought he's finally starting to grow up. Oh, but, he said uh, he didn't mean that. He said he didn't mean it, that he was, um, what's the term you used? Uh, sarcastic. He was just sarcastic. It was not, 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 he did not admit that that was true. He yeah. did not admit that he lost. He never admitted that. And there were other things, too, he didn't admit, which I thought was interesting. She pointed out that he had scuttled the immigration bill. You know, he's criticizing her and Joe Biden for immigration issues. And she points out, which I was waiting for her to do that, and she did a brilliant job at it, about how he had scuttled that bill, the bill that, you know, the, the nonpartisan, bipartisan bill they made. Um, and he never admitted that he had done that. So if you if you were listening, 
you would realize that that was true what she said. He scuttled the bill and he didn't deny it. The other thing is uh, she asked him about uh, o Obamacare. Um, and, you know, he, she said, you've been trying to repeal Obamacare for, what, eight years, um, and you're going to replace it. What are you going to replace it with? Uh, give us the plan. And he couldn't answer that. Instead, he, you know, he blew it off by saying, we're working, we're working on a concept. Really? Um, nobody could believe that. Nobody with a brain in their head could believe that. So he actually never answered the question, what is your plan to replace Obamacare? She asked him about, um, you know, his abortion position, which seemed to be, you know, changing with the change in his underwear. And, and uh, in fact, he admitted that he had never talked to Vance about it. Um, and so if there was a difference of opinion between him and Vance, he was unaware of what Vance was saying and thinking. My personal favorite was when she asked him, when the moderator asked him, excuse me, the moderator asked him, um, do, do you um, want Ukraine to win the war? He never answered that. He came up with this, this poppycock about how he had a special relationship with Putin and uh, day one, in fact, before day one, after the election, assuming he won, he would call Putin and he would negotiate a peace. Well, I don't know if you guys remember, the Logan Act makes that a felony. You can't call a state, a foreign state leader and negotiate a peace, whether you have won the election or not. You have to be president. You have to be a U.S. official to negotiate with a foreign state. The Logan ha Act has existed since 1790, <clears throat> and he was unaware of it. And he made it very clear that, A, he did not support Ukraine, or that was his answer to the question, and B, he was going to work out a settlement directly with his friend Putin in violation of the Logan Act. I thought that was, and he no, never no. did, he never did identify the terms of that settlement. It's whatever Putin wants, that's that's the settlement. Right. Um, I, I just wanna know in your mind, you know, and this is gonna call for some speculation, but why was it impossible for Donald Trump to admit that he wanted to see Ukraine win? It was impossible for him to say it last night. Because he is profoundly obligated to Putin. They have a transaction going. Putin helped him win and, and get by the Access Hollywood crisis back in 2016. Putin tried to help him in 2020. And there's no question at all. Read the newspapers. Putin is trying to help him right now. And by feeding propaganda, by feeding pro-Trump propaganda, into the American system. And you know, you can see on YouTube, you can see some of the propaganda. American people, American actors are running Kamala Harris down and they are bought and paid for by Putin. So he owes Putin. He's not gonna cross Putin. He's gonna help Putin. He's gonna help Putin win that war. And that's why, that's the answer to your question. There's no issue about it. Now, I also you know, thought it was very interesting that he kept doing the lies and he kept doing the insults and he repeated them over and over again. You know, uh, Kamala Harris is the worst and Biden is the worst and it's the worst in American history without giving any detail. And he just, you know, he gave his cult following those kinds of quotable quotes again and again without you know any substantiation or any detail. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think a rational person listening to that would have, would have agreed. But I wanna go back to your point for a minute, Chuck, about a lawyer in a trial setting. You know, frequently in a trial setting, things happen on the other side where um, you need to react. And she had good advice. She didn't try to over talk him, there was one occasion where, where she tried to interrupt him, but that didn't work well. So she stopped trying to interrupt him. Instead, the body language. And she had this smile on her face. She was listening and looking at him. 
And all of that body language suggested that what he was saying was a lie and inappropriate. My personal favorite, where she gave him the kindergarten teacher look, that is, she 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 put her elbow down on the on the, on the lectern, and she put her chin in her hand, and she looked at him with this um, very tolerant looking kindergarten teacher look. Yes, we know you're out of your mind, and we're going to listen to you, but we know we we'll humor you. So it wasn't just that she was baiting him to go on and do ridiculous things. Mm -hmm. She was humoring him in yes. public. So yes. the whole world, the whole world saw this, that she was humoring him. So in terms of body language, in terms of the moves she had while he was doing objectionable things, it was really perfect. And it was much better than trying to interrupt him or argue over him. She was making her case. She wasn't going to play his case. So I thought, I thought that was very interesting. Mm -hmm. And I, I felt that um, she she really had it together, and she had a, a way of dealing with his lies and insults that was terrific. And I think you know you have to remember that this was although there were no audience members in the room, and that was a smart decision by ABC. Um, there were audience members around the world, and if you looked at the you know the internet reactions on YouTube and elsewhere. In fact, on all of the major news outlets, they, um, you know, they let people come in and make comments afterwards, comments from everywhere. The whole world was watching this. This was way beyond the American electorate watching this. This was global. And, uh, you know, you can't forget that. So to the extent that there are rational people out there not Trumpers, not cult followers, not MAGA people who were watching this with a detached eye. He made a mess in front of the world. And when she said uh, that people she had spoken to, uh, former staff members of his, uh, foreign diplomats and officials, all thought um, that, that he was um, a disgrace, a disgrace. That's really his term. She turned his term around on him um, that that went global. You could imagine what people thought when she said that a number of times. And finally, I want to mention before I forget, 20 minutes after this was over, and I guess MSNBC caught it first, Taylor Swift criticized him. She said that he had tried to make it sound like she endorsed him, but in fact, she was endorsing Kamala Harris. And that was really powerful because she has something like 300 million followers. And, and that must have reached a good part of the American audience. Great points. Um, Jay, I think after hearing your words, I'm going to change back the title back to Harris-Trump debate, the world is watching. Because you're correct, the world was watching. So uh, apologies to my listeners, our listeners, because we're going back to the original title. Um, Chuck, at what point in the 90 minutes do you think Kamala Harris really kind of scored a knockout punch? Was there any po point or moment that you thought this is the uh, coup de gras that she really did just finally take him out? Yeah, but multiple times. She did the Muhammad Ali float like a butterfly, sting like a bee mm -hmm. punching. The jabs, the uppercuts. I mean, she took a toll with pretty much all of her verbal blows. There was one in which she got a mandatory eight count knockdown. And that was, Putin will eat you for lunch. Ah. Throughout the debate, all 90 minutes, she looked straight at him. She also looked back at the camera to make points to the people. <clears throat> but throughout the debate, he looked only at the camera. He could not face her. In fact, even when she faced him, she leaned toward him with remarks that he had no response to. He shrunk back. He, he did. did not lean into it. Yeah, so you're right. The, the movements, the body language. The other thing that she did throughout that I thought was epitomized by her, Putin will eat you for lunch, that demonstrates a level of confidence. You're not going to say something that direct, that blunt 
directly to your opponent in front of the world unless you have eaten him for lunch. And she had. <laughs> Indigestible as he may be. Yeah. You know, um, many times debates, they always have a, a memorable line. And I, I, Chuck, I think you're, you're spot on about uh, Putin will eat you for lunch is one of those memorable lines. Uh, for myself, what I, what I got as a memorable line is after Donald uh, was done talking about uh, how immigrants will eat cats, dogs, and pets in Ohio, she, she said, talking about extreme, this is a quote, talking about extreme, and then she laughed. As the world, I think, was laughing, uh, watching Donald Trump defend this internet hoax of a story, and he takes it as serious. And I, I think that really put a light on Donald Trump as to just how extreme and, and really kind of how, what's the word, how naive this man is to what he sees on the Internet. He, he takes it as gospel. And, and is that a quality that we want to see in our president of the United States, particularly with a president that has the nuclear code? Yeah, I think it, there's a core value, a core message that she conveyed throughout and that she summarized and epitomized in everything she did and said. And she did that fairly early on and she didn't need to repeat it because it registered. Mm -hmm. And that is the only client she has ever had in her work, in her life and now and going forward is the people. Great point. And the only group that Trump is not addressing, whose needs he does not even consider, is the people. That contrast was crystal clear. Okay, thank you, Chuck. Uh, we're winding down on time here, but uh, Jay, in your opinion, what was the, uh, the most uh, important moment between uh, Trump and, and Harris in this debate? Uh, did you see a knockout <laughs> moment for, for Kamala Harris? Yeah, I agree with Chuck. The The most um, powerful statement was uh, Putin will eat you for lunch. Mm -hmm. And that's relevant to everyone in the world. But it's more than that. It's more than that. I want to I want to tell you what I mean. Um, I think people will believe that did believe it, um, that the Trump gave no reason to deny that. And he couldn't and didn't deny that. So the way it was left was that, yes, Putin will eat you for lunch. But the implication of it is that he's not going to eat me for lunch. I'm a litigator. Uh, I've been representing people and the people for my entire career. And I'm baiting you and undermining you here in this debate. Nobody eats me for lunch. You, they eat for lunch, not me. Remember that he was baiting her before the debate that she couldn't stand up to world leaders. Well, we got an answer on that one. But there's another point here, too. And it goes to the discussion, um, you know, we've had about body language and which way she was looking and so forth. It's very important. I'm sure she had advice, but, you know, she had to execute on that advice. Now, when we first discussed the convention, I remember telling you guys that she was talking to me. And that's when I got up off the couch and wrote a check to her. She was talking to me. And, and why do I say that? She's just looking directly at me. She was engaging with me. She knew how to do that. And last night was just another example of that. She was looking at me the same way. She was looking at everyone in the world the same way. She was connecting. And when he was making stupid remarks, she was looking with, you know, her kindergarten teacher look at him, um, you know, questioning the, the veracity and fantasies that he has. Um, but most of the time when she spoke, she was looking at me. She was looking at us. She was connecting. Now, what does that mean? Sure, it means you want to write her a check. Sure, it means you believe her. But there's something else, too. He has been criticizing her either on the surface or sub silentio as a woman. A woman couldn't handle this job. A woman couldn't connect. A woman doesn't have the strength. He's a misogynist just as he's a racist. When she presented that way, when she looked at me 
and she looked at him with that certain look, she was really saying, I reject all that misogyny. I can do this, no problem. And he's totally wrong to make the differentiation between men and women. I'm good for it. You know me. And, and I think that was the most powerful thing for me. I, I think she successfully reminded Americans what it was like each and every day to wake up and Donald Trump was president. We all woke up a stress in our, in our minds, in our hearts, in our body, because we didn't know what he was going to say or do. And we had to live for that for four years. And I think she gets an AA plus for reminding all voters, all Americans, just what that four years felt like. And he displayed that last night. All the things that gave us heartburn and stress, he displayed last night. So uh, in my opinion, she, she got an A plus out of the debate and she did shellac Donald Trump. So we've run out of time. I wanna go for last thoughts. Chuck, go ahead. Immediately after the debate, on ABC, they had six commentators, women and men. And every one of the women commentators got the core element that Kamala Harris took control of that debate. She controlled the narrative, just as Trump had done with the media for four years and the continuing very high level after that. When she said, Putin will eat you for lunch. What we all and those women commentators understood and saw is he will because I just did. And she did. And she did. Yeah. She got him. OK, thanks, Chuck. The uh, jury verdict. <laughs> we're, you know we're, at an Im, we're at an impartial jury. Unfortunately, in politics, it's, it's a purely partial jury. But for those impartials out there, there's only one possible verdict. And Taylor Swift has highlighted it. Yeah. Uh, Jay, you get the last word. Well, I was worried afterward when I started to read the comments from the MAGA people um, that uh, you know tr that Trump and his friends were going to try to turn this on its head and lie about who won, because it was really clear who won. Um, but you know, after this discussion, you guys, and after thinking about it overnight, um, I know there are there are many MAGA people who are in the cult and who will love him for the rest of their natural lives, no matter what. But I also think that there are people who might have voted for him. But after seeing that, and most of America did see that, um, they're going to change their minds. They're going to see the points that we have been discussing here today. And uh, I don't know if it's going to carry the day. And I don't know if the polls are accurate. But we should watch what happens now. All righty. Thank you very much for a thoughtful discussion. I'd like to thank my uh, special esteemed guest, Chuck Crumpton. And I'd like to thank, as always, my co-host, Jay Fidel. Won't you join us next week for American Issues Take One? I'm Tim Apicella, your host. And until then, aloha. Aloha.